Again, we've been on a series, we're calling it Not of This World. We're talking about the contrast between this world we live in and the kingdom of God, which we are part of. And this morning, we're talking about the world that is and the world that is to come. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. You should be able to follow along up here. You should have also received your notes. So, uh, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins... You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander uh, of the power, uh, uh, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. Excuse me. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Now the word here... In verse 2, this is the New Living Translation, it says, You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. As we've said before, uh, the word world is a common used word in the New Testament, especially, as I've said, it is the Apostle John's favorite word. He uses that word more than any other word he uses. And um, the Apostle Paul here says that we used to live in the world. We used to live according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Now, the Greek word for world, predominant Greek word that we say uh, used it for the word world, although there's a couple of words that used, uh, is the word cosmos. And the word cosmos means basically the age. But it also can mean an order or the order of the age. And we said that when the word is using the word world, uh, it talks about the order. It's not, it's not the planet. It's the systems of government. It's the hour in which we live and all that's in, uh, involved with that. The complete Jewish Bible translates this, this uh, particular passage using the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek word because, remember, when you're looking at languages, you have equivalents in other, other languages, just like the Bible, the New Testament is translated predominantly from the Greek language, and so we translate it using English words that we think fit the best way of expressing that. The complete Jewish Bible says it this way, you used to live, you used to be dead because of your sins and acts of disobedience. You walked in the ways of the Alam Hazah, which is the word world in Hebrew, and obeyed the ruler of the powers of the air, who is still at work among the disobedient. Now, the ancient uh, scribes, in uh, Jewish scribes, uh, divided the world predominantly between two ages. The one age is the age in which we live, and all that is around us in that age, and that's referred to as the Alam Hazah. And the age which is to come, which would represent the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Messiah, which would be the Halam Habab. And uh, as we look at these two ages, everything related to the first Hebrew word, Halam Hazeh, uh, would represent darkness and decay, those things around us in the age. And the word simply means the age. So we're living in an age right now that we would refer to as the world. So this age we're living in, the Halam Hazah, is the age of darkness, the age of fallenness, the age of the world around us that is under the control and the sway of the evil one. Again, we've said in this series that uh, the Bible calls the devil in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the God of this world. Here Paul expresses and says he is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So again, we need to remember we, there are two basic forces in the world in which we live. There's the force of God, God's spirit, God's presence, God's will, which is the kingdom of light. And then there is the devil and the kingdom of darkness. Uh, And the Bible uses very contrasting words. Paul said to the believer, he said, What agreement has light with darkness? Referring to the believer as light. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? 
What agreement has has righteousness with unrighteousness? What agreement has has um, what agreement has the believer with the unbeliever? In other words, there's a direct contrast between those who are born of God and those who are not born of God. Uh, the Bible says that we used to be darkness, but now we are light. Walk as children of light. And in this particular passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul is really bearing out those two ages, the age that is now and the age that is to come. And because he says, you used to walk according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. You used to walk according to the prince of this air, the air that is the, the dictates of this world under the sway and control of the evil one. That's who we used to be. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've been born of God, that's who you used to be. But now we have been born of God. We've been called out of darkness into the light of Jesus Christ. And he tells us here that we have been joined together with Christ and that when we were joined together, we were raised up with Christ and made to sit together with him in heavenly places. See, we have been raised into a new kingdom. We have been born out of the kingdom of darkness. We have been delivered from that kingdom, translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of our sins. And our, our Lord and Master is no longer the devil. Our Lord and Master is now the Lord Jesus Christ. We are born of God. We have the same DNA as Jesus Christ. We have the same spiritual nature of God Almighty. The Spirit of God lives in us, as the Bible says, that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. So our very spiritual DNA as a believer is the, is the nature of Jesus Christ. That's who we are spiritually. It, and so... Because our nature is the nature of righteousness, the nature of Christ, we're living in a world that's filled with the nature of darkness and the nature of unrighteousness. And the word righteous predominantly means to stand upright. But when we think of the word righteous from a biblical perspective, we think of anything that would keep us from the presence or being accepted with God has been removed through the person and blood of Jesus Christ. So that's who we are. So when the Bible is referring to the age or the world, we have to really recognize that, that we are living in a fallen age right now. We're living in an age of darkness. We're living in an age where the Bible says the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. So everything around us in this world, that's why the world is decaying. That's why the, the uh, what is the first law of thermodynamics that everything decays. This is why evolution doesn't work, because according to evolution, everything should get better. But the first law of thermodynamics is everything decays. And we see the world around us that is spiraling down. Scientists actually believe that the solar system will eventually spiral down into oblivion. Uh, scientists believe that the sun, our sun, will eventually, over I don't know how many billion years, will burn out. Well, I think God designed the universe to perpetuate itself. Um, and I don't think we really have to be too concerned about the sun burning out. Uh, you know, uh, the people that think along those lines, they just got too much time on their hands. You know, so, but the point I'm simply making is, uh, why is the world, and why are things decaying, and why do we find death and darkness and sin and hurt in all of these things? Because the nature of the devil that came into the world and polluted the human race and polluted all of the creation and brought forth the nature of sin and darkness into the world brings forth death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Uh, the nature of sin brings forth death. There was no death in the Garden of Eden. There was nothing imperfect in the Garden of Eden. There was nothing imperfect in the world that God created, the earth that God created, until sin came into the world. And because sin is passed to all people in that all have sinned, this is why we all die. This is why people die. God said to Adam and Eve, if you eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the very day you eat of it, you will die. Well, it's obvious they didn't just fall over the day they eat, ate of it, but obviously... The death he was referring to wasn't a physical death. It was referring to a spiritual death. And had man never died spiritually, if people had never died spiritually, in other words, if the nature of sin had never come into the human being to separate us from the life-giving force of God, then people would never die. But because sin came into the world and cut us off from the life of God and the curse came into the earth as a result of sin, then death passed upon us and we physically die. Now, death is simply, when we think of the human experience, death is simply our spirit leaving our body. When your spirit leaves your body, your body will die. 
the Bible says, as faith without work, this, the spirit, body without the spirit is death, so faith without works is dead being alone. James said that. Uh, he said that your, your body is dead if you take your spirit out of your body. So, whether you're born of God and alive unto God spiritually or not, one day we are all going to physically die should Jesus tarry. Now, the Bible tells us that one day we'll get a new body that is not subject to the curse, not subject to the death in this world. And these bodies, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, cannot inherit eternal life because they are corrupt. Uh, The Bible tells us that they are polluted because of the nature of sin that came into the human DNA through Adam. And so the Bible says that our bodies are decays that the the spirit is alive because of righteousness but the body is dead because of sin so here we are in this world in which we live that is surrounded by darkness almost everything around us has been affected well really everything around us in this present age has been affected or we could say has been infected by sin Romans actually tells us that even the creation groans and travails for the manifestation of the sons of God. Because creation itself, Paul said by the Spirit of God, has been made subject to the curse. So again, creation didn't do anything wrong. Animals didn't do anything wrong. But human beings did. And because we were given authority in the garden by God, Because sin came in through the human race, sin passed not only upon all people, the very nature of sin bled over into the very creation of God itself and began to pollute the world. You know, people say things like, well, why did God create mosquitoes? Or why did God create wood ticks? Or why did God create these things that destroy? Well, we know, obviously, God did not create the animal kingdom to kill one another. Because Adam and Eve... And I'm not making a, a pitch here for vegetarianism, but Adam and Eve didn't eat animals in the Garden of Eden. It's very obvious. They, they didn't need to. But once sin came into the world, what was the first thing God did? God killed an innocent animal, shed its blood, and took the, the uh, skin the, the, from the animal and made them garments to cover their nakedness. And what do we have a picture of there? We have the, what's called the Law of First Mention. And whenever we see something mentioned for the first time in Scripture, it sets a precedent for the rest of Scripture. And so God shed the blood of an innocent animal, signifying that the innocent has to pay the price for the guilty, because the guilty couldn't pay the price themselves because they're guilty. And that set a precedent that one day Jesus, the Lamb of God, would shed his blood for the remission, not the covering of sin, but the removal of our sin, so that we could be set free from the bondages of sin once and for all. And so when we are saved, when we're born of God, our very nature is redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And so Christ doesn't have to die again and again and again, as Old Testament, uh, the Levitical sacrifices kept being recurring over and over and over again, because his sacrifice was good for all. He only needed one sacrifice. So I think we understand that. But we want to go back and focus on this, um, <clears throat> this, this, this concept that not only did this, the curse come into the world, but it tells us in verse 7 of chapter 2 here, in order to exhibit in the ages to come how infinitely rich is his grace, how great his kindness toward us who are united with the the Messiah, Yeshua. So, the contrast Paul is drawing here is these two ages. The Amma, the the first age, which is the age in which we live in, and the age which is to come, the kingdom of Messiah. Because that's what we're looking for, right? When the king, who is Jesus Christ, is going to come back to this earth and establish his kingdom on the earth... Uh, and bring out of this world and reestablish God's will in the earth. And the Bible here says that for the ages which are to come, God is going to literally put on exhibit His glory, put on exhibit His mercy, and show the world all of His splendor and all of His glory. And that's what we're going to spend eternity seeing is the multifaceted glory and splendor of Almighty God. Amen. Which the world has, as Paul said, it is not entered into the hearts or the minds of men, the things which God God hath prepared for those who love him. But God has made them known to us by his spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the one that will continue for the ages to come to reveal these things to us. Amen. 
So when we think about the world, we talk about what's called a worldview. Now, a worldview is a self-descriptive word that simply means the way we see the world, the way we view the world. And when we define the world, a worldview, we're talking about a, a, de, a determined set of values or philosophies or beliefs by which we measure the world around us. In other words, it's how we gauge reality. Now, there are multiple worldviews, and you've heard me numerous times talk about having a worldview, and we talk about what we call having a biblical worldview. And so, as we, when we are born of God, what has to take place in our, our hearts and our minds is we have to change from being people who have an ungodly worldview, in other words, a fallen worldview, the worldview of lost people, the worldview of people under the delusion and darkness of this world, and our eyes get open, spiritually speaking, and then that, that begins to open our hearts to God's world and God's understanding because we recognize that God sees things from a very different perspective than human beings do, right? So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. <clears throat> So again, going back to what Paul said in verse two, chapter 2, you once were part of that fallen world. You once were under the sway and delusion and deception of the evil one. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4 that if our gospel is hidden, it's hidden to those whom the God of this world has blinded their minds. So why don't people receive Christ? Why don't people come to God by the droves? Because their minds are blinded by the enemy. And the enemy uses the world and the things in the world to hold people in bondage to the darkness in the world. And so when we come to Christ, what happens? We are illuminated and the light of Christ shines on us and we begin to learn the ways of God. Again, I said it's like you changed worlds, you changed kingdoms, you changed families. You used to be this family over here, now you're in a new family. You used to be in a family of darkness, now you're in a new family of light. You used to be in a kingdom ruled by the devil and his cohorts, now you're in the kingdom of God ruled by God himself and his angelic hosts, Jesus himself being the Lord and master of that kingdom. So we begin to think differently and learn differently and talk differently and believe differently because we are different. Because because Christ now lives in us. We once were darkness, now we're light. We once were lost, now we're fine, found. We once were blind, now we see. Amen? We were once without hope, praise be to God, now we have hope. Hallelujah. Do you see the contrast there? So Paul says that we once were darkness, but now we're light in the Lord. And since we are light, we need to walk like children of light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Then he said, you are the light of the world. John the Apostle said in 1 John that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And if we are to have fellowship with him, we must walk in the light. And if we say we have fellowship or relationship with God, but we walk in the darkness, we are a liar and the truth is not in us. So we see this contrasting constantly throughout the Bible, referring to the kingdom of darkness as this world of darkness, and the kingdom of God as a kingdom of light. And we must be children and walk like children and live by, as children of light. So what's the problem? The problem is when God's people, God's family, God's children who are born of God live and act like people of the devil. Can we do that? Yeah, Paul said to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So the believer can live and act like the devil, even though they're born of God, if they do not begin to change the way they think. We did a whole series on the renewing of the mind and changing the way we think. But Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to the world, be, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The Amplified Bible says, And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively, progressively, that means continually, changed as, you're, as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes, so you, that you may prove for yourselves what is the will of God, 
what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in His plan and purpose for you. So in other words, we need to change the way we think so the world doesn't mold us into its external superficial customs and belief systems and behaviors. And then we need to change the way we think so that we know what God's will is. Because God's desire is that we know His will. God's will is not supposed to be a mystery for His people. Because we have the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, when the Spirit of truth has come, He will guide you into all truth and show you things have come. He will take of mine and reveal it unto you. The New Living Translation says of Romans chapter 12, too, says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So what does this say? If we're going to be different people and live according to the prince of God, the Spirit of God, we're going to have to change how we think, right? Then you will know what God wants you to do, and you will know how good and pleasing and perfect His will really is. So that's pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? So as we begin to be led by the Holy Spirit, as the Scripture says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. Jesus, the Word says, not being born again of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the living Word of God, which lives and abides forever. So, one of the, my favorite things about the New Testament, the Old Testament as well, but it's really brought out in the New Testament especially, here, is, is this contrast, this constant contrast between God's kingdom and the kingdom of darkness, between God's people and the kingdom of the people of the world. So there's a distinction. Again, when God called the children of, the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called them out so that they could be distinct from the Egyptians. Because remember, what did the Pharaoh want to do? The Pharaoh did not want them to leave Egypt. Right? Moses' continual message to Pharaoh was, let my people go. Well, go where? Go out from Egypt. Pharaoh didn't want the people of God to leave Egypt because they saw them as a resource. So he didn't want to let them go. And what is the, what is the message in that? Well, there's a spiritual message beyond just Egypt, because Egypt in Scripture is representative of the kingdom of darkness. So the enemy is saying, I'm not going to let these people go who I have authority over, but when Jesus came into the earth and crushed the head of the serpent and went into the depth of the, the, the devil's kingdom and took the, hell's, uh, the keys of hell, death, and the grave away from the devil and took the authority that Adam had delegated to the enemy and stripped him of that and rose again from the dead, it says he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And he was set down at the right hand of the majesty on high where he ever lives to make intercession for us. So Jesus literally took away the devil's authority. And remember when Jesus came back to the earth and spoke to his disciples before his final ascension, he said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So I want to remind you that we have the authority that the enemy used to have because it has been stripped from him. We have greater authority because it's been delegated to us. We have the power and authority of Jesus Christ to walk in His authority. Glory be to Jesus. Amen. Because we're joined with Him. So here He tells us that we're to not be conformed anymore to this present age. Well, how, how does this literally take place? Well, it's about what we're talking about, this different worldview. We need to, be, we need to change the way we see the world. We need to change the eyes through which we see the world. It's like putting on sunglasses. If you put on sunglasses, what happens? Whatever color those sunglasses are, that's going to tint the, the light that comes through there, and it's going to change the way you're seeing through those sunglasses because it's, re, it's changing the, the, the image of what's going on in your, in your sight. So, so literally, uh, we need to put on God's glasses, so to speak. We need to put on God's eyes. We need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and walk in Him and make no provision for the flesh. So how do we do that? We do it right here through the Word of God. I used to say that, uh, you know, when you, have, if you, when you drink coffee, which you all know I love coffee, so when you drink coffee, what do you do? You have to run your coffee. When you grind coffee, you have to run it through a coffee filter, right? You have to filter it somehow, otherwise you're going to have a mouthful of coffee grounds when you drink it. So... There's lots of different ways of filtering coffee, but the fact is it has to be filtered. What, how do you make coffee or tea? Well, you run the water, the hot water, over the beans, over the grounds, and 
the oil in that coffee flavors and changes the makeup of the water so you have drinkable coffee, right? So in one sense, what we need in our hearts in walking in is a spiritual filter so that everything that comes into our mind, everything that we see is run through a spiritual filter. That's called discernment. Paul said, I want you to be able to discern. As a matter of fact, he said to the church, the Hebrews, the church of the Hebrews in the letter to the Hebrews in chapter 5 and verse 6, chapter 6, the end of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6, he said to these believers, he said, by this time, you ought to be teaching other people. But I'm having to go back and teach you these fundamental principles of basically Christianity. And he said, those who have, have been grounded in these truths have grown up where they can discern what is right and wrong, basically good and evil. So as we mature, and one of the things this next year as we're heading into the fall, here we're at the fall and we're heading into New Year, and I'm just going to, I haven't really talked to anybody much about this, but one of the things we're going to really emphasize this next year is what it means to be in a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm convinced the biggest problem we have in the Church of America is we have a lot of converts but not very many disciples. And I don't think most believers even realize what a disciple is. As I said before, I think I mentioned this last week a little bit, that um, I think we have this really mistaken concept of what really biblical Christianity is in America. As I said, I think we need to even change some of the terminology that's come into the body of Christ that isn't scriptural. The idea like I'm accepting Jesus into my heart. I think we need to eradicate that phrase, so help me eradicate it from my language, if you hear me say it. I, I, don't, I no longer want to use that term. I think that we need to use the term surrendering to Jesus. As I said, there's a vast difference between you accepting Jesus and surrendering to Jesus. Now, I don't want to get too hung up on semantics here, but the idea of accepting Christ is it's on my terms. The, the idea of surrendering to Christ is it's on his terms. And the very first thing you have to recognize when you come to Jesus Christ is it's not on your terms. Paul, Jesus himself said, if you save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake in the kingdom, you will save it. In other words, if you give up rights and privileges to your own life, you'll find the true life. So the whole premise behind being a believer is losing your rights and your privileges and your, your ability to make a choice as to whether to turn away from Jesus Christ. In other words, you know, it's like that old song, uh, I have decided to follow Jesus. The world behind me, the cross before me, Though none go with me, I still will follow. See, that's the kind of concept, I think, that must be in the body of Jesus Christ in the American church today, is, you know, I, well, I used to be a Christian, but now I'm not. That's like saying, I used to be a hippopotamus, but now I'm a cow. <laughs> it's a ridiculous statement. You're either a believer or you're not a believer. You're either born of God or you're not born of God. If you're not born of God, then you need to get born of God. And if you are born of God, then you need to act like you're born of God and stop being carnal. Stop living in the world. Stop acting like the world and stop thinking like the world and stop talking like the world and stop loving the world. Because that's really the bottom line. That's what John said. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So we have a lot of people that profess to be Christians who really aren't Christians because they're in love with the world. They're Christian in name only. And uh, Jesus gave this parable of the sower and the tares. Remember the, uh, a man went forth and sowed wheat, and then a stranger, an enemy, during the night went out and sowed tares among the wheat. And what happened? It said when they grew up, his servants said, Master, look, somebody has sown tares among your wheat. And a tear is a wheat-like plant that looks like a, like a wheat plant, but when it, you can't tell them apart until they ripen. And then once they ripen, the wheat grows ahead, but the tear doesn't. It grows a grassy stem. The problem with tares is, and if you know anything about gardening, if plants get to a certain age, what happens? The weed grows around the root of the other plant, and if you try to pull up the weed, you pull up the plant with it. Like this summer, Ann was gone, and I was out trying to weed our 
horrifically overgrown pea bed, which I had neglected. And so as I'm pulling up the other stuff, I'm pulling up all the peas with it. Pea pick and pods, you know? So uh, you realize, and Jesus said that, what do you do? You leave them alone until the harvest, because if you pull up the tares, you're going to pull up some wheat with it. So he said, wait until the harvest, and we'll gather them both together. We'll separate the wheat from the tares, and we'll burn the wheat, the tares in unquenchable fire, and we'll bring the harvest of the wheat into, into our barns. So, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. There are going to be people that stand before the Lord Jesus Christ on that day that were never really saved to begin with. They were just pretending. And in the meantime, they were living like the rest of the world. So the Bible says we're to examine ourselves to make sure that we're saved. And I'm convinced there are a lot of people that go to church or profess to be Christians, but really they're not saved to begin with because they're still living in the world. They're in love with the world, and they won't turn from the world because Jesus is not really the Lord of their lives. They've never surrendered to Jesus. They just are whitewashed sepulchers. But that's not a, we, won't, we don't want to get hung up on that and focus on that today But it's worth hearing. We need to hear those kind of messages. We need to be reminded of that. So, as God's people, God doesn't want us to be conformed to the age around us. Now, as we go on in this series next week, by the grace of God, I'm going to share a little bit in depth about how we see the world. Because, you know, there are certain mindsets that we get. uh, You know, there, there are certain things in the Christian mind or in the way we think that, you know, we can look at these things and say, well, yeah, I shouldn't have anything to do with that, right? I shouldn't drink or smoke or chew or run with those or do that kind of old school mentality that, you know, there are certain sins that we recognize, well, that's really a bad sin over there. But really, God doesn't really look at sin incrementally. He doesn't look at this sin as a terrible sin and this sin is not a very terrible sin. We do, but God doesn't. Now, do different sins have different levels of consequence? Yeah, there are certain things we do that will have greater consequences and greater destruction in our lives. Isn't that true? I mean, you can do some things that are still sin, but they're not necessarily going to have immediate ramifications or even maybe major consequences in your life, but they're still sin, and God looks at them as sin. It only took one drop of sin to cause Jesus to have to die on the cross for our sins. Amen? But there are other sins that we know that have greater ramifications. You know, for instance, if I go out and murder somebody, does that have a greater ramification than if I were to cheat on my taxes? Absolutely. Why? Are both of them sin? Yeah. But what's the difference? Well, one is not only affecting the person who I've cut their life off, but then I've, I've affected all that, those people. I, I've affected generations. So which sin is of greater consequence? The one where it affects more people. And so that's why Paul said, by the Spirit of God, those of you who desire to be teachers should understand that you're going to face a greater consequence and judgment for your sin. Uh, You're going to stand in a greater judgment. Why? Because you have a greater opportunity to impact people in a negative way. You know, as a preacher like I am, when you're standing before people and you're ministering the Word of God, we need to be careful of how we handle the Word of God because if I teach you incorrectly, or if I'm filling you full of unbelief or darkness or sin or things that aren't scriptural, that's going to have a greater consequence. And I think of people who profess to be preachers today that are preaching false doctrine and lies of the devil, they're going to stand before God and be held to a greater standard by far than people that are not. And uh, we see that in the Old Covenant. We see it in the ministry of Jesus, where he referred to Ezekiel's prophecy, where Ezekiel said, I am against you shepherds who have robbed my people, have not fed the flock of God. Amen? Because that's our primary responsibility as a pastor, as a minister of the gospel. My primary responsibility is to teach you God's word. Amen? To preach the word of God to you and fill you full of truth. And that's what we desire. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 says, Yes, in the past you lived the way the world lives, following the ruler of the evil powers that were above the earth. That same spirit is now working in those who refuse to obey God. So we, this is pretty self-explanatory, or should be, that we, we need to recognize that there is a distinction between God's kingdom and the kingdom of, or the world around us, the age around us. Again, that world that is fallen, that world full of darkness. And this, of course, is what Jesus referred to when he said, Do not be surprised if the world hates you. 
literally what does it mean? Don't be surprised if the people of this age, the Alam Hazer, the people of this age, don't be surprised if they hate you. They hated me. And why did they hate me? Because their deeds were evil. They hated me because I am the light of the world. It says, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. Well, His own isn't just the Hebrew people, the Jewish people. His own means the people of the planet, the people of the world. He came to those who He created, and the world didn't receive Him. And why? Why does the Bible say that people don't receive Him? Because they're in darkness. So we live in a world blinded by the devil, blinded by darkness. And so Jesus is saying, this is how we used to live, but we shouldn't live that way anymore. Amen? So the bottom line of everything I'm saying, really, is we used to live a certain way. Now we don't want to live that way anymore. And our, the Christian life is one of continual growth and growing in our understanding of Christ, growing in our relationship with Christ, and growing in our discernment. Uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, Scripture says that God no longer wants us to be children carried about by every wind of doctrine and the cunning craftiness of men. Now, when he refers to children in that passage, he literally means some little child that needs to be carried. I think of my granddaughter, Lila. She needs to be carried, although she's really fighting to not have to be carried anymore. So, uh, standing up now. So, but a little child needs to be carried. In other words, they need everything done for them, right? Right? And when we're children, when we're spiritual children, just like natural children, we need other people to discern things for us, right? I mean, if you think of little babies, they they don't have any discernment really in the natural world about what's good for them and what's not good for them, what's dangerous and what's not dangerous, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. So, you know, a baby will walk along and they've got something on the floor. They don't discern that's not food. It's going in the mouth, you know. could be a piece of dog poop, and they're going to put it in their mouth. They don't, they don't discern anything. So we as parents, it's our responsibility to do what? We're discerning for you. You can't put that in your mouth. So we guard our children. We watch over them that they, they don't put something in their mouth that's going to choke them. When we feed them, we, we're careful that we don't give them something that could choke them uh, and, you know, until they get teeth in their mouth. And even then, they have to, we don't give them the same portion we give an adult. So that's our responsibility as parents, right? Boy, that's a whole message in of itself in America today, isn't it? Because we've got parents that don't seem to get that that we let three-year-olds and five-year-olds make moral decisions and all kinds of decisions that could have great impacts upon their life. That's not their responsibility. That's why you're a parent. I don't let my three-year-old or my five-year-old make their own choices. You know, if you let your toddler make their own choices, they'd never go to bed until they finally collapse out of exhaustion, but you'd be exhausted long before that. So, you know, we don't let our kids make choices. You th- have you ever thought about that? We don't let toddlers make choices. Everything they do, we make the choice for them. Now, they may choose which toy they want to play with, or we might ask them, do you want to wear this or do you want to wear that? Fine, and we're trying to train them to make choices. But for the most part, we make all the choices for them. We choose what they're going to eat. We choose when they're going to bed. We choose where they're going to go. We choose what they're watching on television. We choose what songs they're listening to. We choose which friends they get to have. We choose who gets to babysit them. We choose everything because that's what parents are supposed to do, right? Now, we recognize we don't want them to be that way their whole life, though. But why do we do that? Because they're babies that need to be carried about. And so when we are young baby Christians, we need the same thing. That's why Pastor Tim will warn you, don't listen to everybody on YouTube. Don't listen to every preacher out there. Because a lot of Christians today... They aren't involved with a church like this that has a good shepherd over them. They're out there learning Bible doctrine and Bible truth on the Internet. Now, I've been a Christian almost 40 years. And there's a difference between me being a Christian 40 years and somebody that's been born of God two months. I can watch something and go, hmm, I've got the sense this is good, that's not good. 
like Brother Hagin used to say, eat the hay and eat, eat the hay and spit the sticks. You know, be as smart as an old cow. If, if you throw a bale into a cow, they'll go through it and they'll eat all the good stuff off and all the stems. If you've got stems in there, it'll just be a manger full of stems because they have the sense to eat what's good for them, not what's good for them. So, we need to be careful that we're not just feeding on everything and anyone. You know, I say to people, don't feed on preachers that hurt your faith. Why do you want to do that? I don't listen to preachers. I have, I have preachers that I really respect, but in some areas I don't listen to them in those areas because I don't think they know what they're talking about. Now, I have listened to them in those areas, some of them, just because I wanted to hear what their take on certain things was. Because you always want to know that what you're believing and teaching is right. And if it can't stand up to scrutiny, then you better question yourself whether what you're preaching and believing is right. Because there is that danger as well. Uh, you don't want to become what I would call inbred Christians. <laughs> there are a lot of denominations and a lot of Christians that I would consider they're inbred and you know what the connotation behind that is. That's why we don't inbreed people, because you become mentally retarded. And I'm not saying that non-politically correct. That's the word we used to read. What does that mean? It can damage your DNA pool. Spiritually speaking, if you only listen to people in these narrow little camps of thought all the time, it can damage you spiritually speaking. And there are entire groups of Christians that are in spiritual stunted growth because they will not listen to anybody that doesn't agree with them. Can you say Jehovah Witnesses? You know, the Jehovah Witnesses control their people because they will not let them go anywhere or listen to anything or hear anything that's not given to them by the Watchtower Society. That is what's called a cult. <laughs> I don't control what you listen to. Even if I tried, you wouldn't listen to me anyhow. Right? But you should have the wisdom to know that I'm your pastor, and I think I know a few things about a few things. So don't just roll off and, well, Pastor Tim, I'm listening to this guy that says Jesus is coming back in 2021, and I'm convinced it's going to happen. I don't want to hear you. Guarantee you he will not come back in 2021 if somebody's saying he's coming back in 2021. And I mean, I, I've listened to, I heard, uh, I'm, I'm just saying that strange doctrine, there's a lot of strange doctrine out there. A lot of strange doctrine. And there, everybody under the sun's got some YouTube channel or some video on TV or some video out there or some message out there, and half of them probably shouldn't because they're rebels. And they're not under anybody's authority, and they're out there doing their own thing. And who, get, who do you answer to? Who, who holds you accountable? Anybody? I would hope, you know, that if I speak something you disagree with, come and have a conversation with me. You know, we've got to hold one another accountable. That's one of the problems in the body of Christ in America is that people spew forth things that aren't always scriptural. Now, I'll be honest with you, you've heard me say this, I've heard some of my messages over the years, and if you preach as many messages as I do, you're going to say a lot of things you don't agree with. Because the nature of when you're preaching, you might say something like, that's not quite right, so go back and correct that. And I've said things over the years that I've changed my doctrines on certain things over the years because I've grown more, I've learned more. Um, and so we learn and we grow and I'm always growing and I'm always learning and I'm always trying to strive to know more about God and more about the word of God and be a better Bible teacher and better discerning because this is the deal as we grow up what's the what's one of the trademarks of growth and being grown up being able to make wise choices. See, an immature person makes stupid choices all the time, right? That's one of the signs of immaturity. Well, they're so immature. What does that literally mean? It means they don't use their head. They make choices that are really dumb. They make choices that get them in trouble. You'd think they'd grow up by now. You ever hear yourself saying that about somebody? Man, after all the times they've done that, you'd think they'd grow up by now. You think you'd learn something because one of the things from failure is we should learn from our failures. You know, there's nothing wrong with failing. You're going to fail. I'm a master at it. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln said, the one thing I've learned about failure is to fail forward. You learn more from your failures than you do your successes. Number one, you learn I'm not going to do that again. 
But how many of you have ever made the same mistake twice? How many of you have ever been duped into something? It just came in a different package the second time. But after a while, you start learning. You know, I'm, I'm 60 years old. It's taken me 60 years to finally learn some things. You just can't learn everything in 20 years, and 10 years. Number one, I've learned how to say no to things. I've learned I don't care if I hurt your feeling when you call me on the phone and you're trying to sell me stuff. As a matter of fact, I'll hang right up in the middle of your conversation. Click. I'm not hurting their feelings. I didn't ask them to call me, and I don't want to buy it. And I'm, I, you know, this is people are hanging up on them all the day long. So don't be here. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to hurt their feelings. They're used to it. You wouldn't be doing that if you if you didn't. You know, if your feelings are hurt, you're in the wrong job, brother. Because. Uh, And so, you know, you don't have to answer the phone every time some solicitor calls. You don't have to say yes to them. You don't have to wait for their spiel. Just, hey, I'm from so-and-so. Can I talk to... Is Mr. Jerry there? Is Mrs. Jerry there today? No. Click. I don't want to talk to you. Is that being rude? No, I didn't ask you to call me. And I don't want you to call me. So anyhow, I hope that makes some sense to you. Uh, Some of you, uh, maybe you should learn from that. Uh, Amen. So... Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23 through 24 says, Instead, there must be a spiritual renewal of your thoughts and attitudes. You must display a new nature because you are a new person, created in God's likeness, righteous, holy, and true. So, now that we're this new person, we're growing up into Christ. We're learning how to think like Jesus. We're putting on the mind of Christ to think like Christ. So, the good news is we do have the Holy Spirit in us, and if we will listen to the truth of the Word of God and learn the Word of God and learn to discern things by the truth of the Word of God. And see, in this age in which we live, folks, we're living in an age where the Scripture says truth is fallen in the streets. We're living in an age right now of great deception in America. There are so many people that are just so grossly deceived in this country today, in the culture around us. We have an age that was common even in in Israel, where the prophet said they call what is right wrong, and they call what is wrong right. That is the culture. And it says that those who stand up for truth are targeted, and they will suffer for it. This is the age in which we're living in in the United States of America right now. And there are even many people within what we would call the professing church. There are many people that profess to be Christians that will attack you for knowing the truth and standing up for truth. But one of the the keys of growth is learning to discern truth from error, right from wrong. You know, I I know a lot more of the Bible and know more about the Bible and know God's heart much more now than I used to when I was a young Christian. Now, this does not mean that a young Christian cannot have a passionate heart for God and be discerning spiritually, because spiritual growth can happen very rapidly if you'll apply your heart to understanding. And spiritual growth really has very little to do with physical, physical, you know, growth. Uh, you could be somebody that's been a believer for 10 years and be wiser spiritually, more discerning spiritually than somebody that's been a Christian for 30 to 50 years. It depends on your diet spiritually. It depends who you're following after. It depends on what you're giving your heart to. And, and so we can grow very rapidly spiritually but there are some things you just have to grow up into the Bible says grow up into Christ who is the head so we're growing up and one of the things we learn as we're growing we're learning how to discern what is truth and what is false what is part of the kingdom of God and what is the kingdom of the world because before we were believers we really had no discernment of any of that did we because we were blind you know, I think back before I was a believer, back I got saved when I was 22 years old. And if I had continued along the lines I was heading toward, it would not have been a pretty picture. Because I was involved with some things that just, my belief system, I knew where it was going and it would have been really a shipwreck. Like a lot of the world today. And we see this around us, we see it with young people, we see it with older people. The people are just deceived. They believe crazy things that have no basis in reality or no basis in truth 
whatsoever, and certainly no basis in Scripture. And what are they doing? They're being deceived by the prince of the power of the air, the son, the spirit who is working in the sons of disobedience. So one of the telltale signs that you're a Christian is that you begin to think differently about what is reality and what is truth versus what is not truth. Now, the Bible here says that there must be a renewal of your thoughts and attitudes out of a new nature. So, to have a renewal of our thoughts and attitudes is really talking about we're living out of the inner man, out of the spiritual nature that's now on the inside of us. In other words, the motive of our heart begins to change. The desires of our heart begins to change. And as a result, we begin to live differently, behave differently, think differently, talk differently, act differently. That's not an overnight experience. That's not something that is just going to, you snap your fingers one day, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just a mess and the next day I got everything together. Now, it can happen that way. I mean, I have seen people, and my life is a testament of that, that, you know, one day I was just lost, the next day I was radically saved. But that doesn't mean everything in my life just instantly changed. There's still things in my life I have to keep my flesh under, I have to walk out the truth. Bad attitudes, bad behaviors, uh, things in my life that we all fight with because we live in flesh. And that flesh wars against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary one to the other, so you find it difficult to do the things you should. And Paul said, we keep under the flesh. I bring it into submission. I cast those thoughts down. So it goes back to that filter of the truth of the Word of God. So everything in our lives must be filtered through God's truth, filtered through the Spirit of God, so that we're walking in what is true and what is not. So the bottom line today is that we must apply the template of Scripture to our lives. Now, we call ourselves a word church. And the reason we call ourselves a word church is because we esteem God's word as being absolutely true. We don't make apologies for this. We don't believe the Bible is a book among many books. We don't believe the Bible is simply one book of wisdom among other books of wisdom. We don't believe it's just a philosophy to live by. We believe it is the inerrant word of the living God. We believe the Bible is literally breathed with God's life in it. Now, again, this book you hold in your hand, it's made out of pages, it has ink on it. In and of itself, it's just a book, right? You can tear it up, you could burn it. Hell isn't going to open up beneath you, the earth, and swallow you if it did that. People do that all the time. But the point of it is the words that are in this book, when believed and acted upon, the Bible says God watches over his word to perform it. These words that are recorded in Scripture are God's thoughts to his people. They are standards for his kingdom. They are words of wisdom to live by. And they are boundaries to keep us from living outside of God's will for our lives. So we have the Old Covenant when the children of Israel came into the land of Canaan. And God establishes certain, um, what we would call laws, which is really a bad way of rendering the Old Covenant laws. I know it's called laws, but it makes it very narrow and I don't have time to go into that. But these are simply instructions for God. And why has God given the children of Israel these things? He establishes a method of worship called the tabernacle, right? And he gives them all of this instruction as to how they're to approach God. He establishes a Levitical priesthood. And he talks about these, these rules for, uh, uh, for hygiene. In other words, foods you're supposed to eat, foods you're not supposed to eat. Um, how you're to treat your children. How your different standards that were very, 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 distinct from the nations around them. This is the main thing. Um, In the book of Leviticus, in the Old Covenant, we're we're not given everything God wants to do in people's lives. It's just giving these people who really aren't even born again. They don't have the Spirit of God living in them like we do. So God puts up some 
some boundaries for them and some, some stringent guidelines for them to keep them from going off into Never Never Land over here. Now, the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is the Bible says, I will take out of you the stony heart and I'll put in you a heart of flesh and I will write my laws upon your hearts and you will walk in them and obey them. The difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant uh, under Christ is we have the Holy Ghost living in us today. God has taken out of us that heart of sin and we have the Spirit of God living in us today. We don't go to a temple made of wood to worship God because that's not where God lives. God's presence was in the tabernacle. God's presence was in the temple later on. God's presence is in us. Now, God's presence is all places. Now, people might say, well, that's why we shouldn't be going to a church. Nonsense. They went to to synagogues. The early church still went to the temple because it was the place designated to meet God. But we have a different covenant based upon better promises, Jesus himself being the mediator of it. So, the thing is, those those, uh, the idea of, of the New Testament versus the Old is the fact that it's a renewal of a covenant and God's Spirit now lives inside of us so we can be led by the Holy Spirit today. So we don't need all of the same things that they had under the Old Covenant. That's the difference. Boy, I didn't really mean to get into all that this morning, but that's a big pie to chew that we don't have time this morning. But we're going to wrap this up this morning. The bottom line is we're looking at we're looking at this world around us is that we as God's people must learn to discern what is right and what is wrong. What is true and what is not true. Remember in the book of when Jesus was, before he went to the cross, his disciples were asking him in Matthew's Gospel, the 24th chapter, and Luke's Gospel, the 21st chapter is recorded, and they come out of the temple and his disciples said, Lord, what will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the age? There's that word age, world. What's going to be the end of this world of darkness we're living in? Because they recognized there was another kingdom coming. What should we look for? What are the things we should look for? And what did Jesus say to them? The very first thing Jesus said, Be careful that no man deceives you. Be careful that no man deceives you. Well, if Jesus himself said that, then we must be careful or we could be deceived. And then uh, numerous places in the New Testament, the Bible talks about those in 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians talking about the Antichrist that's to come. It says that because they love not the truth, God will send them strong delusions so that they believe a lie and are not saved. Well, why would God send people strong delusion? Well, it's somewhat of a play on words, really. It's not that God is ordaining delusion. It's that they're choosing to be deluded. Because if you don't love the truth of the Word of God, the only thing left for you is delusion. So in the last days, the days in which we're living in, one of the signs of the last days is there'll be great delusion. Jesus said, there'll be false messiahs. There'll be false Christs. Being deceived and deceiving many. Paul said in the latter days, evil men will become worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So what's one of the characteristics of the last days according to Scripture? Deception. Well, how do we keep from being deceived? Truth. Truth. Jesus, the Word of God says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that the Word of God is alive. It's a living thing, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and the very thoughts and intents of the heart. In other words, how do we divide fiction from reality? How do we divide what is lies from what is truth? How do we divide what's God's will from what the devil's will is and what the world's will? The truth of the Word of God. That's why the Word of God must be our final authority. It must be established in your thinking, in your heart as a believer, that I don't care what the world tells me. I don't care what scientists come up with. I don't care what some philosophy teaches me. I will stand upon the Word of God because obviously either I don't know enough yet or I'm not seeing something here. Because there are answers in the Word of God to every question human beings can pose to God. We have not entered into an age of great mental enlightenment. If anything, we have entered into an age of great pagan stupidity. There is nothing new under the sun. 
You hear people say things like, well, now we have scientific advancements that put to rest all the superstition and mythology of Scripture. Nonsense. It, if anything, it just reestablishes God's will. True science does not turn away from the reality of God. True science finds God in creation. What we have is a lot of stupid science today parading itself as man's wisdom when reality it's nothing more than man's rebellion against the God that created him living according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience so this is my point next week we're going to get into this how everything in the world is degraded that's why everything that starts out by God's people will eventually fall into the hands of darkness and become sin the very schools that ordained to be preaching centers of the United States of America the Ivy League schools of the East Coast Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Dartmouth, all those schools were designed to raise up preachers. Now they're institutions of paganism and anti-God bastions. Everything, if left to itself, will become swayed by the darkness of this world because it will be naturally taken over by the darkness of this world. All it takes is one generation to die and another generation comes along, and the righteous standard that was established by the first generation, if not maintained, will eventually be deteriorated. Francis Schaeffer talks about it. He talks, it refers to it, the late Francis Schaeffer refers to it um, as the accommodating of the world. Where everything, the Word of God is always bent, and the will of God is always bent to the accommodation of sinful human beings. Well, that's just too standard. It's just too strong. So what happens is God's Word becomes bent to the will of the world around us, and that's what we're seeing around us today in the world. Really, This is really the church's finest hour. We heard that word this morning from, from our dear sister talking about, you know, we have the victory. We heard that from both our sisters that shared a word of prophecy. Well, that's really confirmed in the word of God. This is not the hour of the church's defeat. Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Literally, the gates of hell cannot stand up against it. In this hour, the church must stand up in unity and speak forth truth to a dark and dying world. We are the ones who have the word of God. We are the ones that have the ways of light. We are the ones, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that give truth into the darkness and solve the world's problems. Because every problem humanity is dealing with right now has a moral con- or moral root to it. Everything. Every law, every institution, every problem we are seeing in our culture today, it is simply the result of human beings in deception and living apart from God's will. If we will turn back to God, God will heal our land, restore our forms of government, restore these things. And we as God's people must learn that, that we need to stand in the face of this darkness with truth. So going back to what I was saying, we are living in an age of great deception. But we will, only, we will not be deceived if we will stand firm upon the word of God and hold it as our final answer. Let God be true, but every man a liar. As God has said, I, will, I am the truth. I don't care what people say. Because you're going to have to have that kind of attitude. Because Jesus said, if he's out, somebody's out in the wilderness and they say, here is the Christ, he's over here. Don't go. Don't go over there. Don't listen to them. Why? Because if you do, you might be deceived. The Bible says there will come such strong delusion and deception upon the earth in the latter days that if it were possible, even the very elect of God would be deceived. I never thought I'd see that in my days in the United States of America, but it is so true. We are seeing preachers denying the faith. Men of God that I once really respected and held in high regard are now denying the very Lord that bought them. Why? Why would they do that? Because they have not grown up to discern and love the truth, and therefore, because they have not loved the truth... They're subject to deception and darkness, and they're being deceived by the prince of the power of the air. And this is the irony of this, is these men of God, these once men of God who I respected, and there are a number of them, once they turn away from the light, guess what they do? They attack the light. They attack believers. That can tell you what spirit they're of, doesn't it? Because anyone that attacks believers and attacks the body of Christ and condemns Christianity in one shape or form or says we are not the way, you know, we're not the answer. Christian, Christ is not the answer. Guess what? 
they are the spirit of Antichrist, and they've given themselves over to something that's not right. So these are the things we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen. These are the things we must discern.